session and all that, but it's been been great. The guys have uh, done a good job with it. It's been fun to just kind of see our progression so far, you know, and with with the players, and then obviously the coaching staff, and you know, a lot of a lot of teaching going on with everyone. But uh, it's been it's been positive so far. So um, anyway, I mean, you guys start firing away. I said total breakout session. Going to kind of just take this wherever y'all want it to go. So anything y'all want to ask or know about, I'll fire away. Shallow screen. Shallow screen. Yeah, that's a kind of popular one right now. Um, basically, purely designed for man. Um, and what he's asking about is, is we hit this for we've hit it for a number of years now. Um, but most most of you maybe have saw it when we played Michigan in the Fiesta Bowl. We had two touchdown plays um, helped us win win the game this past season at TCU there. But basically running a guy on a shallow and uh, generally for third down, red zone, or whenever you kind of game plan against people where you feel like they're going to get in some man to man situations. And our guy's running a shallow. It's a receiver screen. He's running shallow and. Uh, and then a receiver opposite of him is going to crack his defender. And it's legal because that shallow guy is catching the ball on a behind the line of scrimmage. Um, so, I mean, just uh, is, is this what you're just kind of curious to know about? Yeah, I mean, just so if we're in base for us, we're in two by two. If I can draw kind of bigger here. I'm usually a small draw guy. So for us, for example, if we were doing it with our H right here, he's running a shallow, and then we teach him basically once he kind of gets beyond the tackle box, he's going to kind of shave this thing down a little bit just to ensure that when we do drop it to him, he's going to catch this thing behind or on the line of scrimmage. So he's going to chew up the grass, and he is truly cracking the guy that's man-to-man -man on our H here. Everybody else just simply is running off our back. Technically this way, back would be over here. We put him on a check swing. So if they are in man to man, you got two backers in the box here. We're hoping that that would pull one backer out of the box. Lots of different ways to do it, to motion to it, just to ensure and identify if you're getting man or zone is uh, something you need to do. So again, this is 100% a man to man play. Um, we've done it out of stacks. We've done it out of three by one. We've done it out of two by one. We've done it uh, a lot of different ways, um, but it's just, O-line's blocking normal protection, all right? Six-man protection, that's all they're doing. It's just a normal pass play for the O-line up front for your running back. And, uh, you know, it's just high percentage. And it's just one of those that probably bends, bends the rules a little bit. And, um, you know, if you do run it, I would just make sure you tell the rest before the game that, that, that you're doing it. I've had that happen like three times in my career already, where we tell them in the little pregame meeting with the refs. And, and uh, they'll throw the flag and you kind of go ape shit there for a second. And then they, they all three times I've seen it, they pick the flag up. Um, so anyway, it's been a productive one, definitely for a number of years now. Anything so more on it? What if they're in zone? You gotta have another zone answer, right? So a lot of times, like I said, we'll motion to it. We'll be in a set where, you know, we'll try and identify have a man zone identification for the quarterback and we'll kind of have our zone answer or our check play ready. Yeah, yeah. We've been caught just a few times where, you know, I've gotten hosed on it thinking it was man, I think about two times. And we're still able to complete the ball and at least put it in play, um, but not usually won't have a huge play off of it. Yeah. What's your quarterback do with it? Quarterback's purely just dropping back and just trying to hang on. I mean, he's, it's all pocket presence. This does take a second at times just trying to allow, you're really teaching him to try and allow this thing to get out of the tackle box. Just to eliminate trying to have to throw over people. You get a lot of people nowadays that show zero blitz. The ones everybody doing nowadays, they're dropping out, right? So just because of all those things, we're trying to allow him just to buy as much time as he can, great pocket presence, and try and throw this thing out of the tackle box. Just to eliminate trying to throw over people. He's dropping any or move, trying to move people's guys. Yeah, I mean, really just trying to scan anybody. I'm trying to tell him basically anybody here over. He's just trying to keep them over on this side of the field. Play side is going to take care of itself. 
It's really everybody on the back side of the play. Try and hold them, and then you'll just work from there. Yeah, but just a normal drop back, three-step drop for us, buying time. It goes simply just... Outside release, pull them out of there. Yeah, run right, them off. Are they pre-snap for the quarterback, or is it just absolutely no-go for those guys? No, it's no-go. Yeah, if we call this, we're throwing the screen. That's it. That's really his only option. Could you build in and throw a fade? Absolutely you could, but for us, if we call this, he's, he's throwing the screen. Yep. Yeah, it's been, it's been a, you know, it's just one of those, it's kind of cheap, right? I mean, it's, it's one of those, it's inexpensive, which is why you like it as a coach. It's easy to teach. You get a lot of different receivers that can obviously do it. You know, you kind of get talking about screen game and you're trying to throw <coughs> missile screens and kind of those jailbreak screens. Those are all great. And man, they're pretty when they hit. But you got to have that type of receiver that can do those things, right? Who's fearless enough, who can catch it on the move. Those are harder to duplicate with a lot of receivers and a lot of skill people. You know, things like this, average Joe can go throw and catch that deal, right? Um, you know, so that's, that's why we love it. Receiver turning his numbers to the quarterback? Yeah, yeah. So if you're the quarterback and I'm the guy running that little screen right there, I mean, he's truly just running the shallow and he'll end up just giving you this deal. He's staying on the move, hauling, hauling tail across. Yep. What else? Coach, when you struggle, what, what are you going to or a drive starter that you need that's just, you know, things have been shit for a little bit. You, you gotta kinda get some rhythm and some flow back into it. What do you, what do you like, what do you need? That's a great question. I'd be curious to know everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's in here because we've all been there, right? Things are going like crap. Everything on that game plan you thought was going to be really good stinks. A couple of your players are out of the game now, and all of a sudden it's a whole new ball game, right? So we've all been there. Um, I mean, just things where you just know you can put the ball in play. Um, that, that's kind of my, I guess, philosophy on it is, you know, just what is it a, a little RPO, a simple screen, manufacturing, a, a jet sweep. Um, you know, some quick game where obviously you feel pretty good that the ball's going to get out very quickly. You know, things like that, um, just to where you feel like something within your game plan you can manufacture, and there's not a ton that like has to go right for it to be successful. You know, so I know that's kind of a general answer, but yeah, I mean anything kind of jet sweepish, things where you got some options, got to in line with an RPO, you know, things where you got multiple ways where the ball could get put in play at a high rate. Um, you know, if you got a quarterback that can run it all, I mean, shoot, we did this a ton last year with the kid we had at TCU who was, I mean, if you watch a little bit, he's just one of those <coughs> warrior guys, right? And he kind of had this whole Tim Tebow phenomenon going on with him. But I mean, shit, one of our best ones was just getting two by two and run quarterback lead draw. And he had two options just to throw a quick, you know, quick out. I mean, just some some stuff simple like that. You know, and we're, we're kind of always that way anyways. You know, even if we're struggling or not, I mean, for the most part, it's just get off to a good start, you know, on P and 10. Um, you know, but I think by the same token, you just can't be ultra conservative either, right? I mean, you gotta let them know you're gonna kind of go after them a little bit as well. You know, so I think you just gotta, as a play caller, gotta do a good job of kind of mixing that up. Maybe even when things maybe aren't going great, you still gotta be willing enough to be aggressive and go after them a little bit. Quarterback drills, Quarterback drills and mechanics. What do we do? Do you, do you have a, a set progression? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're listen, we're not like ultra indie heavy here, just with our, our style of offense and just how we practice. It's honestly not just a ton of individual, really for any skill position. Um, a lot of that's gonna come in the off season and in summer for our guys. But like right now in spring training and everything, I mean, it's a lot of group work. It's a lot of just trying to build timing and chemistry, really with everything we're doing from passing game and run game. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, there, there's a there's a certain few drills we'll do every day, almost like as a warm up. Um, just quarterbacks, very simple stuff, uh, just to kind of get their their feet firing and and uh, just kind of get them going. But yeah, a little bit pre practice wise, and then uh, generally during the special teams <coughs> period for us in our practice, that's when we'll really get our hand deep. Is uh, you know just purely during special teams and so one thing I think we do that's maybe unique and he knows this so he was there at, uh, at East Carolina when I was and so that we, we added this at our time at ECU so generally most people when you have special teams at least in, in the way we practice everybody starts out with field goal right getting rapid fire their quick kicks for the day and uh, you know obviously that's your O-line D-line and tight ends generally involved with that and so our receivers that are not involved in field goal, they'll come over with us as quarterbacks, and we still five minutes there basically in practice, stealing time to throw goal line fades. And that's at the, our special teams is at, at the beginning of our practice. And so I thought that was such a great tool for us that we kind of just stumbled upon a little bit there at ECU, and it served us well for a long time now, just because how much time in practice do you actually get to do that of spending time just getting the muscle memory of throwing goal line fades or goal line slants or whatever you throw down there in the tight zone. And it's at the beginning of practice, you're not taxing your wide outs. It's not like they're killing themselves. It's about 50% speed. And our quarterbacks, I mean, all five of our quarterbacks are on our roster over there and they're throwing. I mean, and we're always doing that. So, um, you know, you're just asking that question, maybe think about that. I think that's something that maybe you know, if that's something you guys do, you could incorporate it that way. It's a good time to incorporate and kind of steal some time there. Um, you know, we do that every day. And so all of a sudden you look up after spring ball, fall camp, and during the entire season, that's a shitload of reps that you just got with your quarterbacks and receivers doing goal line fades or goal line slants or whatever, um, and just creating that muscle memory. So, yeah, I mean, during, during special teams, that's when we'll hit some ND. And for the most part, it's going to be things <coughs> revolving around, you know, just pure footwork, whether it's different actions we have in kind of for that day, you're always going to hit some drop back footwork, quick game footwork, and any kind of play action that we have in, I'll, I'll try and massage that during our indie. Um, and then one, I may show this tomorrow, is uh, it's just what I call a window drill. And I mean, I'll kind of draw it here. Basically, what you can do is you can get, I'll just kind of use dots or, or squares. I'm not an artist or anything. So just imagine these guys as, as bodies, okay? I'll use quarterbacks or receivers, whoever's not involved in another drill. The live quarterback, you can set this depth however far you want. Generally, these guys are gonna be about 10 yards away from your quarterback that's up. And I would get two wide outs or two guys, whoever you want to catch the ball to do this as runners. So your receiver is going to start behind these defenders that are probably about four yards apart, all right, four to five yards. Me as the coach, I'm back here. I'm going to be behind the quarterback that's facing the defenders, obviously, and the receiver. And all we're doing right here is I'm going to tell this receiver when once he pats the ball to simulate a snap, he's just purely just jogging across behind these defenders. Before the snap of the ball, I'm pointing at those defenders and I'm telling them when to spread out, okay? And so all you're working here, if I point to these two and tell them to go this way, then he's creating a window. And so now all this quarterback is doing is just working on anticipation on when to throw that ball. So we throw a lot of four verts, we throw a lot of crossers, we throw a lot of things kind of in the intermediate part of the field. This has been a great drill um for us you know and and i really do think that us doing this consistently this past season my time at tcu with with uh, max duggan wasn't really known as a great passer you know in his career if you follow him at all he became really good at throwing things over the middle he had a great year doing that and i do think this kind of helped you know develop him and that probably wasn't his strength going into this last season but just a simple window drill. You can kind of mix up which defenders you pick, which way they slide. You can kind of mix that up. But that's been a really consistent one for us here, you know, over the last couple of years. So just to kind of touch on that. I'm going to show some video of that.
uh, tomorrow, I think. What uh, depth between the, the yeah? Yeah, uh, just probably like two or three yards. Okay. Yeah, just a little, just a little depth behind them. Yeah, and this doesn't have to be full speed or anything. I mean, it's fifty percent, and you're just trying to tell that quarterback throw it in that window, whichever window opens up, you gotta wait for the first, second, third, or even the last window. You're trying to throw it as soon as you can behind that near defender's ear hole, right? Of being on time. And so that's just all you're really coaching them up on. And they just see it and they get a feel and they anticipate. <clears throat> Uh, like drop back, drop back. I mean, four birds. It always kind of starts there. I mean, that's just everything's predicated off of that for us. Our whole passing game is off of four birds. Um, certainly, Y cross still, and all the variations that come along with it. You can just tag and and uh, mix that up as much as you want to. Mesh. We still invest in mesh quite a bit. You know, I feel like maybe a lot of people have kind of gotten away from it a little bit, we still definitely invest time. And it is one of those plays, I mean, if you're gonna do it, it is expensive. I mean, you so better. Like, you were selling packs off of that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, back in the day, Ace 92 was one of the most basic plays you could have for any kind of air raid terminology guys in here. You know, and, and for us at our level, and certainly in the Big 12, with those defenses we saw, it was a ton of drop eight and all this exotic stuff just because of all the passing game you see in that league. Um, you can run just base ace 92. I mean, you better have a bunch of different ways to kind of get some of that stuff if you're gonna get mileage out of it. But yeah, we, we've already, you know, invested a pretty decent amount here at Clemson already. But yeah, cross, mesh, uh, verts, um, you know, still have some sale concepts. Um, <coughs> You know, and then they've kind of developed a few little pick plays kind of within our base concepts of just things where we can, you know, maybe manufacture a little bit better man answers or man opportunities within some of our base concepts. But yeah, it really just kind of builds off of that. Scissors, switch. Um, you know, a couple years, we were pretty, pretty strong at that concept. To me, that's one of those, like your quarterback better have a good feel for it or else you're wasting your time. Um, but our guy, I guess about, I guess three seasons ago now at SMU, we, we were pretty strong at scissors and uh, I've always loved that. And I think we found a couple good ways to do it and all that and some nice backside tags. Here's what I'll say about that before I get on a tangent. Scissors, a lot of people will like to throw that to the field, just have space and a lot of grass. You know, I, I don't know why we got on this, but we did a few years ago at SMU. We started really running scissors a lot out of three by one into the boundary. Um, whether that's just an open trip set or, or more of a three by one like tight end set, but we got a ton of mileage out of that into the boundary. And yeah, the grass, you obviously don't have near as much space, but it doesn't have to be nearly as open because it's such a shorter throw. And I'm talking about throwing the corner on scissors. Um, that's something that, that was a little different for me than my past background with Leach and kind of all the air raid guys. We just never really did it much into the boundary. But I, I thought that was something that's been very beneficial the last couple of years. Okay, can you mind drawing that up into the boundary? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so just imagine this is a uh, left hash. And I'll do it out of a uh, out of like a tight end sniffer set three by one. So again, imagine this is left hash. You know, basically the alert or the first read, we're gonna run a seven step post, all right? And then our number two would be the corner here. You can mix it up, whether the Y or the H does it. In this example, I'll do it with the H. You know, for timing purposes and to basically give yourself a little bit better chance versus man to man, because we kind of almost double stem this guy or a double stick. So he's gonna take a loose two path, straighten up at 10 to 12, and then he's gonna come underneath that post, okay? 
So really at the end of the day, this is gonna be at 10 to 12 yards, the top of that route, all right? Tight end's gotta be the flat controller here. So you can chip, you can do a free release, whatever you wanna do. I'll just do it kind of with a little chip arrow, becoming that flat controller. And then now with this to the field, a lot of people will run kind of like a, a end concept to create that high low or kind of a cover two answer to the backside. That's great. It can get a little awkward with this being to the field and this into the boundary. It sometimes just makes this throw way too much over the middle of the field, if that makes sense. So a lot of times here, what we would tag is we would just simply just get a curl flat, just a little bit cleaner out of a fib alignment and a fib play. So for the quarterback, he's kind of looking pre-snap, um, alerting the post. From there, he's just simply playing a high-low read between this little smash concept between the Y and the H. All of that gets cloudy. If he recognizes cloud, cover two, anything like that off of coverage recognition, he can get to the curl flat very quickly and not have to mess with the scissor side. But that, that's been a pretty good one when you can play action, obviously. But that's been a pretty consistent one the last couple of years. Coach, I saw y'all running um, your GT counter, kind of that bunch set with the little bubble. Mm -hmm. um, what all are you teaching the quarterback as far as that? Is it, is it, a, is it a triple option type play? Is it just two options? Is it pre snap? What all? Yeah, more of just kind of in general with most of our you know, run quick screen type deals is number one, do we have leverage for the screen? Um, you know, and if we do, we're gonna try and throw it. And then based off of that, then it goes more to box counting numbers, okay? But just just kind of simple layman's terms, it's, it's definitely, we're looking out to that quick screen side. If we feel like we got leverage and numbers, we're gonna try and throw it. And then purely off of that, box count. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can incorporate some kind of triple option components to that, but for us, it's more just hand it off or dish it out. <coughs> we good here? Anybody need this anymore? I think quarters, obviously, cover three, cover two, all of it's pretty good. You know, even a man, if you got a dude that can run that route, it's it's pretty decent versus man just because of that little double stem. It's kind of, it's kind of a quicker double move almost as I think about it. I'm just thinking about it from a high school standpoint. You got a younger quarterback as far as trying to throw, but he can make that. He can make that throw. It doesn't have to be open as much, but you know, that's that's not that long of a throw because that corner route ultimately into the boundary, it's not too different than a sail route. It's not like he's just high, 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 and all of a sudden this is a 30 yard throw. I mean, this can be a 15 yard throw a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. Could you draw up how you run the mesh? Yeah, how do you just base way or anything in you, particular? How about at a three by one? Three by one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could do that. We can do that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, one of the most base ways for us, still a lot of different things you can do, but a lot of times our yes, no, this has kind of been the same for a long time. It's really yes, no into the Z right here. All right, or number one to the trips would be on an out cut. So if they're just giving you great soft leverage, let's take it rhythm rhythm three or a one one big. Kind of probably depends on your quarterback's arm strength here in terms of your footwork, but this is more of the yes no. There's your yes no. From there, we're teaching true mesh here. We're check swinging to the uh, to the single side, and then out of three by one. This has changed over the years, but one that we will get to quite a bit is really giving this guy a read, all right, our number two. And so what his read's gonna be is really just, is it one high or two high, all right? Not man or zone, is it one high or two high? If it's single high, he's gonna end up running a 15 yard dig, okay, if it's single high. If he got two high or split field coverage, he's just simply gonna post it, okay? 
So that is a read. We don't do a lot of conversions or a lot of reads for our receivers, honestly. Um, we kind of more think about just being on the same page and where our quarterback didn't have to guess what that kid's doing. And, uh, you know, guys seeing things differently. But this is one of them. Had some mileage out of it this past year. Had some production. But, I mean, that's one of the most basic ones for us. You know, like I said, in terms of reads, we're yes knowing this. And you could change that to a vertical if that's better suited for you. You can change it to a lot of things, but yes, no. We're coming down to the mesh next. This is more advanced, probably. I mean, if you got a pretty savvy guy at quarterback, you could start to probably incorporate that into the read a little bit more, most likely based on coverage. Um, so you got to have a QB that can handle that. But for the most part, we're going to that yes, no at the Z to the mesh. I mean, it's that simple. Um, and then that in or that post will kind of become later once you get a better feel for it or you do it enough to where you know kind of when to tell your quarterback to attack that dig or that post. I'll keep reading across the mesh. You know. Full picture. So not, getting, not getting fixated on one guy. I mean, you got a sense of feel that whole mesh just as a whole. That's the expensive part of just repping up. The That's the expensive part and then the expensive part of tight mesh, when to keep running, when to sit, receivers understanding that you got to define it for the quarterback when you do sit. So many times these guys, when they do sit down, they kind of do this deal, right? And they keep drifting. And all of a sudden that ball is a little inaccurate and it looks like the bad news bears, right? Well, that's because when he's sitting down, he's drifting instead of sticking it and giving that quarterback an actual target of where to put the football. So it's just all those little details that show up if you're really gonna have production out of this play. Yeah, it's, ex it's definitely expensive. <laughs> and there's some, there's some kind of, uh, you know, cheaper ways to do mesh. A lot of people are doing the quick game mesh now where, where the back's on a rail route, you know, and he's the first <coughs> read. The shallow, the underneath guy's the second read, and then you're getting to like a deep OTB route. I mean, everybody in America is kind of doing that. So that's a definitely a less expensive way to do it. But in my mind, that's not really mesh. That you're not really having to coach all the ins and outs of what you're going to have to do with this play. What's the rule as far as telling them what they can sit? You know, I know they can sit versus tell them, but do they have to cross the ball or are they? Really, the main rule. Not necessarily. Really, the main rule is you just cannot sit down until you actually mesh with the other receiver. Once you mesh with this receiver, once you have that midpoint right there, then it's all free game from there. And then it's just based on where's the where's the most grass, where's the most space, those sort of things. So that's really the main rule. You just got you have to actually mesh with the actual uh, receiver. So what, uh, what else are you tagging off of 94? I know we did a lot of picks and pieces. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you start you start tagging a post on the Z, that means you're probably going to wheel the H. Um, doing it with motion helps, you know, and just try and uncover and unsettle the defense a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, still the post wheel stuff, there's a way – you know, doing it from trips, that's a simple one that I would think is a, probably a popular play, um, especially at the high school level, just because it, I think it's simple and I would think most quarterbacks probably have the arm strength to, to do this, is getting in some of those condensed sets. You know, getting in some tight sets like this and where you're still meshing here. But now all of a sudden, you're just running a true corner and an arrow. So you're just getting smashed on the front side and then simply getting down to the mesh here. We're still check swinging, you know, as a base roll with the back. And so what happens is this gives you a little bit of a front side man answer with that arrow, just because you're kind of creating a rubber out with that release. Um, you know, obviously for cover two and for cloud and things of that nature, you got the corner and you got the smash high low ability there. And, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, this one has been one we've kind of gotten to over the last few years. That's probably a little different from when we were together. Pretty simple one. <clears throat>
Yeah. For the most part, post wheel type stuff. Yep. And then um, your best advice for the second year OC coming up. Um. Well, obviously you got to take away. Take away from the good you did as you in your first year. You know, but obviously you got to really hone in on the things you weren't as good at, and uh, you know, identify what, what was the reason you weren't very good at it. And I think always just try and trim what you can. You know, try and trim what you can from verbiage, from signaling, from the amount of things you do. And I think if you do that, you're probably going to sleep a little bit better at night, and at least know you're going to kind of live and die by what your guys do well. And so, I mean, that's just kind of at least our, our mentality. Um, but I, I would definitely say that. Coach, what other uh, bunch concepts do you really like? Out of that tight, snug bunch. Yeah, we've done a... Uh, don't major in it. Don't major in it, but we definitely have gotten into a little bit more of that stuff last few years. But. I mean, you gotta listen. You gotta find really about two, maybe three quick games, you know, or quick games slash a little bit of run game with some screen game out of it, like you already kind of asked about, you know. But then mesh, um, still variations of Y cross from that, and then still finding ways where you can get clean exchanges or releases with four birds. You know, it's probably something that we did a little bit more of this past season at TCU that maybe I hadn't been around in the past as we started swap running. Receivers. Yeah, different switch releases, swap releases from those bunches just to kind of give yourself some clean clean releases at times. It's probably something we got a little bit more into this last year, but we got a lot of mileage out of it too. Um, you know, so I thought I thought that was was productive for us. But yeah, just still at the end of the day, kind of what we felt like we were gonna have a chance to be pretty good at and uh, and trying to utilize that out of bunch. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, some somewhere in there. I mean, that, that number will vary a little bit, but yeah, I mean, you're going to try and, for us, keep it around 30 uh, for sure, whether that's a little less or maybe one or two over. I'll do the same thing. How much, how much leeway do you give yourself or ingenuity each week based off of what you see? So are you carrying over 80% of your playbook and it'll never change based on what you see? And you leave yourself 20% to change it up each week? Because, you know, we can get too creative and too crazy. Yeah. To players out of the game. Um, I don't know if I necessarily have a percentage on it like that, but I think I think maybe the more important thing to me is, okay, of those, let's say it's 30 plays, of those 30 plays, you know, I, I, I better feel pretty good that 25 of them, 22 of them, I don't care what they do, if they come out and do something totally different than what I saw them do from scouting them all week, I'm still going to feel good about those plays. You know what I mean? And we don't have to get in this check fest. And all of a sudden, us as coaches got to be perfect. And the quarterback's got to check every play. Like, that's what I don't want to happen. So at the end of the day, because of that, you're going to end up probably running a lot of your base stuff like you're kind of alluding to. And you're going to stay pretty close to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're always going to try and have things in there that we really don't care what they do. We feel like we're going to have the ability to have a pretty good play. Uh, and if it if it if you <coughs> think that's going to happen, um, and like what I told you, you better you better trim that shit and uh, take it out. That's just that that's how we think. Um, you know, and I think the other thing about that is how we practice, and we don't script. We don't script. Our defensive, our young coaches or GAs and those guys that run the scout team. I don't tell them exactly what to run. You know, we're calling to play fast and those guys have to, they have to call the defense and get it going based on how we've scouted opponent wise. You know, if, if Duke's 40% blitz on tape, if we scouted them, well then our team periods, our young coaches in the defensive scout periods, 
they better give us 40% blitz. I'm not telling them exactly which blitz to bring. They'll know that based on watching tape too. Um, but my point is by you doing that and giving those guys freedom to call whatever, they may call some dumb stuff to kind of get you at times, but it checks your rules on what you have in that game plan. And so if we're watching team period and I'll be damned if they went two man on us in that play and they, they stoned us and we didn't have an answer, well, it kind of checks our stuff. And so that's why I like not scripting and giving our guys a lot of freedom from a practice standpoint, because it really checks us, it checks our rules up front, checks our stuff in the passing game. It, uh, you know, it uncovers a lot of kind of good things for us, you know, and it kind of, I guess on the plus side, a lot of times it verifies why you're doing things. You know, a lot of times it works out the way you want it to. Um, you know, so that kind of that kind of goes along with your question in terms of some of the game plan stuff or or script stuff. Favorite red zone concept? How low or how high? Inside the ten. Inside the ten. All right, inside the ten. Um. I mean, in general, just things where things where you're attacking, you know, the entire end zone, you know, front of the end zone and back of the end zone sort of concept. I mean, what are you going to get down there? You're going to get man, you're going to get zero, or you're going to get some sort of goal line red zone seven stuff, right? And, um, you know, you're going to have to create some sort of high low uh, for the most part once you get down there that tight. Um, you know, so I think you know, mesh has been great down there for a long time. Mesh with posts over the top, that kind of creates the high-low that I'm talking about. It gives you man and zone answers. Um, you know, it's an all-purpose play. That's why mesh is good, and that's why it's investable. In theory, it's all-purpose. Um, you know, so something along those lines of, of, like I said, really attacking the full, full uh, field of the end zone as you get down there tight. Um, you know, a lot of nice little bunch concepts that you can kind of accomplish that with that you're seeing a lot nowadays of, like, a, like I said, just kind of creating some high lows out of bunch sets and kind of making it a little more awkward for them defensively just from a split standpoint. They're just kind of moving splits from receivers and, um, you know, maybe dictating a little bit what they can and cannot do down there. You know, so those, those are things to look at. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a that's a hard one to talk about, right? I mean, that's one you just got to show them over and over and over again. Um, but I mean, honestly, in general, kind of what I've said in here, I mean, you just you got to resist the temptation of trying to get fixated on one on one receiver, you know. And and if it's man, you pretty much know if they do happen to be a man. A lot of times, you know which mesh guy you're going to hit. You're going to hit the guy that's underneath. Right? Um, the guy that's over the top is kind of the, setting the pick, just like in basketball terms. He's the guy setting the pick. The other guy is the pick and roll dude. He's coming underneath. So, you know, in man, a lot of times that kind of gives them a little bit of a cheat of where the ball's probably going if it gets to the mesh. Now, if it's zone, like I said, that, that comes with feel. That comes with a lot of the repetition of it, of kind of feeling that whole picture there in the middle of the field and feeling where the grass is based on where the backers are dropping and attacking. So, yeah, it's not like this great coaching point I kind of have with that. It's just, it's really, truly repetition at that point. Do you always have your guy from the right setting the mesh? You know, like, that's how they used to teach you a lot. Like, yeah, that's, that was the old staple forever. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff, for us, for me, has kind of changed a little bit with the with the formations that we're kind of in and out of now and the tight end. You know, I mean, the tight end has changed a lot of the old air raid roles when you start playing with tight end formations. So you gotta, you gotta kind of manipulate that a little bit at times because of that. But in general, our Y position is setting the mesh, um, really no matter what side he's on. 
So you gotta kinda adopt some some consistent rules if you're gonna be in some tight end sets. It's kinda how we've approached it. And man, what kind of climbing rules do you get when you're at center on uh, mesh? Really just stay in the course. Yeah, we're not teaching the deal where you know they mesh and man at a certain point they're gonna start to climb and really get up the field. For us, it's really just truly running away from your man and uh, staying flat and friendly. Could be something we could get to in terms of a game plan thing, but that's not like a base rule for us. Yep. I like it when it works, it looks awesome, but there is a little bit of that, what angle is he on? It's just kind of another thing to work a little bit, and that's just why, I guess probably at the end of the day, I haven't really gone with that. How's the adjustment been here for you guys here coming from a different style kind of offense to more of an air raid, and do you still use a, like a three day period to install most of your offense? Yeah, yeah, still three day install. And um, like I said, it's, it's, you're always, listen, I've done three, <laughs> I've done three new kind of installs offenses in the last three years. Um, so I've had a little practice at it, I guess. You know, the, the deal here is the, the staff didn't really know it. At the other places I've been, those guys have been kind of privy to a lot of <coughs> things that we do. And here it's just a little, quite a bit different that way. Um, but no, I mean, listen, we're at Clemson. We got a lot of smart guys here. I mean, we got a lot of smart players and, you know, just guys that can mentally handle that. And so honestly, probably a little bit better than I probably would have guessed coming in, you know, just in terms of staff and players of how quick a lot of this stuff has been processed. And you can kind of see it early on in our first few practices of just, you know, were we executing things at a higher rate? Hell no. But like we were going out there and functioning though. I mean, we could operate and we could function very quickly. So, you know, that kind of shows me that our guys buy in and, uh, you know, their processing is, is at a good start. Yeah. Do you have a set method or series of questions that you definitely want answered when you start? And I know you all have the ability to have GAs and everybody doing all kinds of legwork in front of you. But when you sit down and finally start watching to prepare for another opponent, do you have like, are you looking at your safeties or, or outside backers? Or what's your kind of thought process there? Just in terms of like what scheme I think we're going to be putting in or more just getting a feel for them, like what is <laughs> either, but really just kind of like, how am I going to hurt these guys? And Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you got to look at what's what's giving them problems, right? I mean, how are people, how are people scoring, number one? What kind of teams or what are people doing to sustain drives, you know? And then obviously, what's, what's creating some explosive plays against them? You know, those are kind of a lot of the initial things that I'll pull up you know, for us, play on Saturday, on a Sunday, when we start diving into people, I mean, those are kind of the first first few things that I'll start watching on top of just probably a couple games. But, you know, those are always the first few things that I'll try and identify early on before I start getting into formation cut-ups and things of that nature. But, um, yeah, and I think kind of through that, by doing that early, I feel like I maybe get a sense of where our best kind of matchups are. Right, you know, where, where are they most vulnerable? Where can we exploit them? Um, so I think it probably starts there for me, at least just watching tape and kind of getting going on the next opponent. That kind of answers your, your question. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I guess more, uh, trying to think about it, right? So everybody's kind of going more towards play action. Doing yeah, a lot. Pull the guard, slap the tech, pull yep. the back, build the edge, with the pull and guard. Yep. Is it as easy as calling like Trey 85 and running wide cross across the middle and hit that intermediate? I mean, so is it combining just these offensive line right there and they get their call, you know, 85, they know it's play action? Yep. And then just tagging your 90s behind it and hit intermediate? Or is it a separate whole thing? Just tagging it behind? It's just tagging it. Yeah, it's that simple. It's easy to call. Verbiage is easy for the players. 
receivers don't know any different. You're just giving them the play, and they don't know the play action and all that <coughs> stuff. So it's just, yeah, it's very simple. Yeah, it's not like this whole other category. Yep, yep. Yep. Or, or PO game, too. <coughs> Favorite one? Um, you know, I mean, I honestly haven't done a ton of like run scheme with tagging glances and, and things like that. We just haven't, I feel like, got to major in that a little bit. Right. I mean, that's just, we hadn't done that up to this point. Yeah. Um, not to say that we won't, or you're going to be different offense every year. But yeah, I mean, for us, it's been a lot of the RPO uh -huh. stuff. Is, I mean, it's boring, but I'm telling you, the most probably productive one for us the last five years, and as a young coach when I started getting into the business it was probably our best one too a stick draw and I mean I know that's boring and not sexy but that's been one of our most efficient and best ones um, for the last five years um, you know so that's been good I think I think kind of the new wave of it a little bit for us minus throwing concepts like a lot of people will it's really just finding different ways to manufacture some some arcs or some bubbles some different ways to manufacture those quick screens right. off of runs. You know, through these condensed sets, through bunches, through starting in condensed two by two, motioning to condensed three by one, and just finding those little different ways to maybe uncover some guys to, to where you're not just in standard three by one open sets to where people are blowing up your arcs and your quick screens all day. And people just get so used to seeing that. So I would say we probably have gotten into a little bit more of that the last few years to try and manufacture that. Um, and then off of that, you get some good stuff. You get some nice screen and goes and just different ways to kind of get to some of that off of that. Um, you know, those, those are the first few that probably come to my mind that have been um, you know, pretty consistent for us. But yeah, we just, we just haven't majored in it too much. Talk about your, how are you coaching the quarterback, running back through the stick draw? And I was actually at Davidson in 2008 or nine. Yeah. Really oh, really? Yeah, y'all were doing it. They had an air raid clinic, and we were doing it back then. But I just, so can, can you give me a 14-year refresher course? <laughs> yeah. Um, I like it. Yeah, I mean, for the quarterback, he, he's purely, can I throw the stick or not? Okay, and the good thing is, I mean, you can go about it in a couple different ways. I mean, just as a base one here. True, just three by one. A lot of different ways to do it. I mean, just a simple way for us, truly, is to stick route, run a quick out there. You got a fade value there to the field. Okay, and then honestly, what we're telling the, the running back is just by alignment, his base alignment, he's not gonna be too far away from the quarterback, obviously. And you gotta be a good actor. You gotta, gotta know what you're doing back there a little bit. But honestly, we're just telling that back. I mean, don't be a statue. When the ball snaps, we don't wanna just stand there and just kind of create that, hey, this is obvious, something's up. Um, you know, so he's gonna get in an athletic position. And honestly, he's really just not activating until the quarterback presents the ball. Activate when he activates. That's just what we tell our guys in terms of the running back. Um, I told mine to stand there and act like you're pass blocking, like you've only pass blocked. Yep. Don't stand <laughs> in the middle line. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Do your normal pass block, then we're going to hand you the ball. You exactly. Make it look believable, but yeah, you can't just start drifting up the field and now you got a bad exchange, right? So yeah, it's just staying put laterally from the quarterback, but just having some movement to you. And then you're going to feel when that quarterback extends the ball, activates, that's when you activate. Um, Pre-snap wise, I mean, obviously, if you can throw the stick, you're just catch punching and you're throwing the stick right now. And then, like I said, for man value, you still do have an answer between these two routes potentially, or you're gonna have to get into a check, right? You start getting outnumbered in the box, you don't like any of your man value um, with this route, you're gonna have to check it or have some other different combination going on out there. Up front, are you wrapping your guard? We, we, we've done that, yeah, we, we've done that, but no, really more off of just true pass pro zone kind of protection, yep, yep. 
and simple check is, you know, you get out manned and they're three over three on your on your wide outs and you've got a six man box. I mean, check to just a pure pass or get to quarterback leap draw is always a simple one that a lot of people will get to. So, yep, yeah, it's been, I don't know why, it's just, it's worth a long time, right? That one's worth a long time. What else? What are you running backside of the football game out of two by two? Uh, I mean, a lot of still, you know, double slants, vertical with the quick out, um, dig with a little spot route just to create some high lows, some cover two kind of answers or uh, cover three answers as well. Um, you know, outside receiver hitch, inside receiver, inside fade. You know, kind of the modern day smash now. Yeah, so nothing, nothing earth shattering, but kind of mix it up probably between about four, maybe five, kind of backside con combos. But still, still a lot of slants. You know, try to. How, how has your wide routes changed now that you're playing with eight back a little bit more for attacking the part of the? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I would say the main thing that's changed is is for us or for me, it's been just probably doing it a little bit more off of, off of some switch releases, getting different guys to actually run the cross, um, you know, and, and utilizing the tight end or slot receiver in different ways to where it's not always the same receiver running the cross every single time. <coughs> Probably just mixing it up a little bit and getting some switch releases out of it, and um, you know, probably attaching some true backside ends instead of like a post curl. Or a, you know, a lot of people have a post curl as kind of that fourth or last read of just incorporating a little bit more end against some people, you know. And like I said, that's kind of what we went to maybe a little bit more this past season at, at TCU. It's things where we can truly hit guys in windows on the move. You know, and, and getting some end tags on your wide cross play, I thought was was useful for us, just because that gave us another way to throw guys on the run in windows. You know, it just like like I mentioned, we just saw so much drop eight and exotic coverages that I couldn't tell you what they are. I mean, everybody's just finding a million different ways to cloud and exchange, and you know, do all this kind of inverted type stuff that we see nowadays, and. You sit there and you're telling me this quarterback knows what coverage is pre-snap. You're full of shit because you have no idea. Um, I have no idea. Maybe y'all do. I definitely don't. Um, you know, so it's just a ton of post-snap reading that's having to go on right now, you know, at least for us. Um, so I just felt like incorporating some ends um, probably helped us, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a visual. Yeah, no, great. <clears throat> I'll just draw it kind of from here. Yeah, you can take this as, as left hash. So whatever you have front side, a lot of people are gonna have sale concepts on the front side. I'm gonna be running it this way. And so you could take, if we did the uh, cross with our X right here, you're doing it with your number one receiver now. Well now you can get a nice switch release where in zone coverage, they're gonna have a corner sitting most likely somewhat head up to outside leverage potentially of this close split. Well, now all of a sudden you can gain some nice leverage on that corner with the big tight end running the end. And nothing's changed for the quarterback. It's the same old progression he's always had with this play. Nothing's changed at all. You're just exchanging guys, you know, so the thing is that you gotta look at is number one, can you invest having different receivers run the cross route for you? And if you can, you know, then I think stuff like this is probably really useful for you because it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't change anything for your quarterback, which is the most important thing. And it checks swing your, your tail back there to the uh, to the left side is how, how we would typically do it. Yeah, so. And so, I mean, if you were getting edge pressure your, off from the field, your H would be your hot. Yeah, he'd be the hot, and for us, he'd, we kind of have some base rolls where, you know, we're not really hot unless 
kind of start getting into the zero type of stuff. But yeah, like I said, you can change that front side tag with a million different things that you want. But yeah, I mean, you're probably gonna have a good edge pressure. Probably gonna be throwing that sail route, you know, or throwing that cross, you know, pretty quickly. Some of it's kind of an ever-evolving deal a little bit, but first of all, I think two by two's the hardest for a quarterback. I think, um, and trust me, I, I do not know it all at all. Three by one's easier to read, you know, in my opinion. It's just a little cleaner, a little easier to read consistently for your quarterback. You know, a little harder maybe for them defensively. Kind of maybe tips their hand a little bit more. Um, you know, so we, I guess, long story short, we've kind of gone to a little bit more of a bender mentality as opposed to, you know, in too high or in zone where you're kind of hooking it up and throttling and doing that deal with your scene guys. We've kind of ruled it up to where you truly have a bender and where his, really his main two deals are, I'm either seaming it outside the hash or if I get a bend read, I'm 100% bending it in. It's one of those two things only. And you know, we went to we went to this at SMU a few years ago, and and honestly, the reason why is just because of a lot of the man coverage you see nowadays with heavy outside leverage, where they're forcing you to go in the middle and try to feed you the little, all those hole players and, and post safety. Um, you know, because that was taking away seams and. Also with drop eight, it was hard to throw seams, true seams, in the drop eight stuff. It's just those windows, you know, close in a hurry with a lot of those coverages we saw. And so again, we were just trying to create more of those window type throws where we were bending and we were throwing in windows between backers and safeties. And so that's kind of what we adopted with the last the game few years. Plan, I guess you see those areas in zone, and that's what you kind of concentrate on. Or Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, I think in general, that that's probably something positive we did from a philosophy standpoint of, of playing those sort of man teams like I described, where a lot of this drop eight coverage is not shying away from throwing that stuff, you know? I mean, you better be drop eight, for example. You know, those guys aren't exactly in the right spot with four verts and benders and all those things. They're not in the right spot. They're giving up a big play. You know, you're throwing some other concept against drop eight. You may put it in play, and most likely they're going to rally and make a tackle for maybe not a very good, big game. You know what I'm saying? Like using quick game, trying to nickel and dime them. What you got to do that? We all know. But you try nickel and dime drop eight all the time. To me, that kind of feeds into their hands a little bit. The plays into their hand, and so we just kind of took the philosophy of, of we're gonna. We're going to manufacture some of those window throws against some of that stuff. That's what, when I watch you guys play at, at, at drop eight stuff out west, so to speak, that we, that we don't see here. Yep. And you guys are throwing it no matter what. Yep. And I'm scared to throw it when it's too <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I get it. Yeah, so I mean, that's just, listen, that's just what we believe in and what we feel like we got need to be good at, you know, and we'll, we'll see here. If that's something we're just not as good at, I probably won't throw it as much, but, um, you know, that was definitely the philosophy the last couple of years is we're going to attack those guys that, that do that. And that's really with any coverage, but I guess my point is, in my opinion, you can't shy away from doing it against those sort of zone teams or people that are dropping some guys. <laughs> like, you need to go attack their ass and not let them off the hook by just based on what they're doing. Last time I checked, they're on defense. They gotta, they gotta stop what we're doing, you know? So it's just kind of that mentality. What's your rule as far as the bender? If you got a landmark that he breaks or bends it and how far he can go or what's his? Yeah, in general, um, in general, there's just nobody on his hash, he'll seem it. Um, you know, and then if he bends it, it's going to be generally in that probably 12 to 15 yard range. 
and he, once he bends it, he's, I mean, he's going. There's no like bend and then all of a sudden stop. Like once you bring it in, you're going. And uh, I mean, that that's really in general kind of what we teach our guys. But I mean, we will still bend it versus a lot of single high. And that's what a lot of people can't wrap their head around at first is, is why you do that. It's, if it's one high, you've seen it. Well, y'all show me, I'm asking, but if, if y'all throwing a bunch of true seams against single high, I would love to watch it and how consistently y'all nailed those because that's a hard throw. It's gotta be thrown right on time. Um, you know, and then think about man free, for example. It's man free, and if you're teaching because they're in single high, you're gonna run a seam. Those seam throws are hard against man free. You gotta beat your guy number one, and you gotta protect him from a post safety on a true seam. Like that's hard, um, you know. And so I just think those are hard to, to mass produce. And so, like I said, we just kind of went to more of the bender stuff, and and it's helped us versus a lot of single high stuff for sure. Did anybody have an option to bend or just your two stops? No, you, you, two by two, yeah. getting kind of in your head right now. Right. Yeah, no, we we've, we've kind of. We tried to roll it up right now where it's basically one guy's more on a seam or could hook it up and the other receiver would be on a seam or a bender. That way you just don't got two guys bending in and, and kind of that whole thing. Um, so yeah, we tried to roll it up to where one guy's doing one thing, one guy's the other. And we kind of designate who that is. Three by, three by one is the easier in your two middle. Number two. number two, yeah, yeah, number two. Three is still three still getting to the bar hash. Right. Yeah, number two is going to be kind of the the bender mentality guy. That actually is still Yeah, yeah, no, I mean that's what we hit it the most against. <coughs> yep. Yeah. But like anything, I mean you gotta you gotta really <coughs> hammer it, and you know I was talking about the window drill and just all the things that kind of lead up to that, you know. But it's it's we've gotten quite a bit of mileage out of it the last few years. Been good to us. Do you think the quarterback room has changed since the six because it's been so good? Oh yeah. We had that, so if you know that's not that's not what we want one high pick six six. Yeah, a lot of things we'll kinda of throughout the week package, you know, like yeah, quick game check or you know, you were asking earlier about kind of game plan plays versus just your base stuff, how much you carry, right? Well, on a lot of those things that maybe are game plan-ish, you know, say it's five, say it's five calls that I would consider game plan-ish plays. You know, on probably all of those, he's gonna have a simple answer to if it's not something we like, hey, get to this base play that we've done a million times. You know what I'm saying? And that may not be the most ideal play in the world versus whatever they're showing, but at least it's something a little bit better and it's something we know. Um, so yeah, that's, kind of how we think and package and deals. Yeah, but oh yeah, I mean, a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of that. A lot of freedom that way. Y'all be asking this guy some questions. <laughs> Man, Taj Boyd over here, he's done it. He's done it a little bit. Uh, what are you telling your quarterback? Hey, you can't be filming this, man. <laughs> All right, uh, scared me for a little bit. Um, what are you telling your quarterback uh, when you're getting like a simulated pressure look? Let's say like double A gap, you got six in a box. Uh, is it a lot of you know protection uh, stuff that you're letting him know, or you know what what routes are, are you trying to use out of that? Uh, yeah, like like you're saying like in a zero blitz kind of yeah they're, they're showing you zero look but i yeah. mean a lot of times you know they show you that and then they're dropping a lot in coverage so how are you dealing with that yeah i mean for us you, you have in some of your drop back concepts the ones you do have you're going to have some hots built in all right and that's going to activate it um and so if they do drop out in theory you're still in a good play because you just got your normal concept going on so i mean in drop back you got hot adjustments that'll be happening and then otherwise if you get into a check deal you kind of have your little menu that that you have your zero answers that you like all year you know and you know we've done this before where if you get zero what are my best two options to a two receiver side like what are our best two little route combinations versus zero 